everyone. Sorry, my contacts. Um, <clears throat> so this is part two for the uh, lecture on the genus Homo. Um, so hopefully you watched part one. Uh, we talked about Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and now we're going. We are going to continue that conversation. Um, so we're still on the same PowerPoint. It's all one large PowerPoint. I'm just splitting it up into into three sections for for lectures. Um, so we're starting on slide 20. Um, so a slide 20, it says later Homo, and there are three bullet points with those three um, species: Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, and Homo sapiens. <clears throat> Um, so for this, for this, for part two, I'm actually going to talk about just Heidelbergensis and Neanderthals, and then I'll save uh, Homo sapiens for its own, like, third part three of this series. Okay, so you'll see in the picture there are two skulls. They're facing each other. There's one on the left, one on the right. Now, if we were in class, I would ask you, does anyone know what species those are? Uh, usually someone does. But so as you're looking at this picture, um, the one on the left is the Homo sapien, and the one on the right is the Neanderthal. So what I want you to kind of uh, get from this picture is that, um, one, there are quite a few similarities, like no surprise, um, they are a hominin. Um, so I want to make this clear, and I think I get into this in, in the actual PowerPoint, but um, humans are not uh, a, a descendant of Neanderthals. They are not our direct ancestor. We share an ancestor with them. So just like if we're thinking back to like six million years ago with uh, chimpanzees, we did not come from chimpanzees, but we share a common ancestor with them. So hence there are going to be similarities. Um, so if you're looking at this picture of the human and the Neanderthal, you'll notice some general similarities. Um, but the, hopefully you notice some differences, and, and there are a few things that I want to point out. So one, that their head is much bigger, so Neanderthals were, were fairly robust. Um, and there's one other important thing I want you to notice. So look at the the shape and the size of the brain case, where that where the brain would be in this in this individual's head, in that cranium area. Um, hopefully you notice the shape. The shape is a bit different. Um, the human head is what we call globular, so it's a little more round, like a globe. The Neanderthals more long and low, kind of football shaped, so a big difference there. But hopefully something else jumps out to you, and that is um, Neanderthals have a larger brain. So Neanderthals on average have a larger brain than humans. Um, in fact, it's Neanderthals have the largest brain of any hominin, often for whatever reason. And actually, when we talk about Neanderthals, we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, this is something that's uh, a lot of misconceptions about Neanderthals, but they actually did have uh, a very large, very large brain. Okay, so so actually moving on to the to the details of this PowerPoint. Um, so if you go to the next slide, slide 21, we're going to talk about Homo heidelbergensis, my favorite hominin. Um, in fact, I have let's see if you can see this one. I have <laughs> I have heidelbergensis tattooed on me. Um, in fact, it's that picture, that one that's right there on the PowerPoint. Um, so this is a very famous skull called Cobway. Um, I love heidelbergensis. Um, very interesting to me. Uh, focus a lot of my research on them. Anyway, so here's some details about Homo heidelbergensis. So remember that I told you I'm never going to ask you to remember the exact dates. I want you to know general timeline, like if you like to know like which ones, which species came before which and stuff like that's important, like relative timeline, but not like an exact date. However, I do put these up there for your frame of reference and like for general information, it's interesting to see like as we're getting closer and closer in time, like to present, that we're not in the millions of years ago. We're in the hundreds of thousands of years ago. So now this is not even that long ago. So Homo heidelbergensis. Um, so some similarities with Homo erectus, um, they still have that uh, uh, the fairly large brow ridge and you can see that in the picture. Although the, the shape of the brow ridge tends to be a bit different between these two species. Cranium still long and low. Um, but we're seeing some differences too. We're seeing a big jump in the brain size and I can tell you based on like my own research that the 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 facial structure um, is facial morphology um, Especially in the upper face and 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 around the maxilla is actually quite different. Um, so it's very uh, distinguishable for this particular species um, And then you'll see that really cool Smithsonian recreation So now just like before with Homo erectus and Homo habilis, it's looking like it's looking more familiar to us, you know 
Okay, the next slide, uh, slide 22. So uh, remember I told you I'm never gonna ask you like to, to recall exact dates uh, or locations, but this is just a good frame of reference. You can kind of see where they are in the world. So we're seeing sites in Asia, in Europe, in, in Africa. Um, and remember that we talked about this with Homo erectus, that Homo erectus is the first one to leave Africa. So some populations remained in Africa, some populations moved into, um, um, like basically across Asia, like into the world. And so we're seeing the descendants of, of this group um, in, those, in those same general areas. Okay, so if we go into the next slide, slide 23, you'll see um, just a really, some really cool examples, some more like specimens and, and locations of where we found them. So here we went from Germany, you can see that big brow ridge, that fairly large uh, cranium, although the shape is still long and low, like the uh, like Homo erectus, so more like a football shape, we're still seeing that. Um, slide 24, another one, you can see this from the side, those, those fairly big brow ridges, and I can see um, that there's some really interesting morphology going on in the face and, and the, the zygomatic, but like I'm not gonna, you guys don't need to worry about that. Um, so that's just kind of the wrap up of, of Heidelbergensis. I know like the meat of this is gonna be on Neanderthals, that's what everyone loves the most, that's fine. Uh, I like Neanderthals too, they're pretty cool. Okay, so slide 25, Neanderthals. Um, or Homo Neanderthalensis, Neander Neanderthals is fine. It is not Neanderthal, it has never been Neanderthal. Do not pronounce it that way. If we were in class, one of you would say it wrong and I would get mad or jokingly get mad, but can't do that, you know. But it's not Neanderthal. You, sometimes you'll see it written with TH or with T. It doesn't matter. It's still pronounced the same way each time. Neanderthal, Neanderthal, not Neanderthal. My AC just kicked on. Hopefully that's not too loud in the audio. We'll find out. Oh, good. Um, <clears throat> okay, so some, some negative views about Neanderthals. So before we even get into the actual discussion on Neanderthals, like for the PowerPoint, like this is something that for whatever reason has just kind of permeated us culturally, like this, these negative views of Neanderthal. Um, and in fact, if you call someone a Neanderthal, you're not, it's not a positive thing. You're not like giving them like a compliment. You, it's usually used as an insult, which is weird because in fact, they are pretty awesome and amazing. Um, existed longer than our species has existed. We're very successful. We're very intelligent. Um, like I mentioned before, had very large, large brains. Um, <clears throat> but like, what is at the root of this, this, this weird narrative we have about Neanderthals? Like, as you can see in this picture, I have one of these early depictions of it being like kind of hunched over. Um, and so the, the, like, I want to get to this. I think it's on the next slide. You'll see, let's see. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Slide 26. So, um, this one, one of the very famous specimens, there's been a few, but some really, some of the earlier ones for whatever reason, um, like helped aided in this, in this weird narrative we have of Neanderthals that they, um, um, were hunched over and, and all this. And, you know, and obviously we knew they were fairly robust. So we have this really odd picture of them. In fact, what was going on with those first few specimens is actually like these individuals had severe forms of arthritis. Um, like in their spine and other areas. So if you're looking at just those one or two specimens, you're seeing someone that maybe probably would have walked hunched over in their lifetime. Uh, that's not indicative of them, like their morphology as a species though, but this, you know, like the scientists realized that fairly quickly, but it was, you know, like the people, um, the, um, like, the everyday people who who uh, kind of took this and ran with it and just became this thing and and in fact like it's it's so incorrect. Um, like I said, you know Neanderthals are pretty interesting. Okay, so the next slide, Neanderthal intelligence, slide twenty seven. Um, so like I mentioned before, very large brain. In fact, they have the largest brain of any hominin, fifteen hundred cc's. So I know we haven't talked about humans yet. That's going to come up on the next on part three. But I know I've mentioned this in class a few times that uh, on average human uh, brain is like 1400 cc's. Um, so Neanderthals had a, lar had a larger brain. Now, I know you're probably thinking, maybe hopefully, um, that we had talked about like large brain or brain size and it's important to re remember that concept called encephalization quotient. So remember that is looking at, like a simplified version is looking at uh, body mass and brain size and um, what you, like we were looking at this ratio of what would you expect for an animal of any, of any, of any given size, 
what would be the brain size you might expect for an animal of that size? Now, if the brain is actually larger, so like for humans, as if, for example, for an animal of our size, our brain is much larger than you would expect. Um, typically, that maps onto higher cognitive ability. Um, so we have a high EQ. Neanderthals also have a high EQ. Now, the human EQ is slightly higher. Does, I don't think there's a way to argue that that means we're, sleep, we're slightly smarter. It's not really that, it's not that simplified. Um, but we do know that they did have larger brains than we did and our EQs were fairly similar. So, so like no, no, no surprise, like they're highly, highly intelligent and so much of the evidence is pointing to that like without a doubt. Um, so a few other things, so for language, there's a little bit of evidence on language and I, and I mentioned this in the, the PowerPoint or the lecture on the research paper, like if you wanted to use Neanderthals for your research paper, um, looking at language would be a really interesting thing. I'm sure there's some really interesting research into that. There's been a, a little bit, um, for example, like here per, per the bullet points I have, um, there's a, a gene that there, um, that there's been some research that it has to do with uh, language um, acquisition. Uh, their hyoid bone, so this bone um, in their neck. Hold on one second. Whoa. Okay. Um, their hyo hyoid bone is shaped fairly similar to humans, and we know that we really have uh, we have really complex language. Uh, it's like you know, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Circumstantial evidence, but like it's interesting. And then their ear canal stru structure is is similar, um, which, like as you know, language isn't just about producing it, but it's also about like, you know, hearing it. So some interesting uh, research there. So the next slide, <clears throat> uh, 28. Uh, what am I? Okay, 28, um, the tools, tools. Um, so I think I mentioned this when we were talking about paranthropines and australopithecines. I'm not sure, so if I didn't, I'll say it now. So, um, I know I mentioned this with with Havilis, that we have we have evidence that Havilis used tools. That does not mean that earlier species didn't use tools. No evidence is not evidence of something. We don't know. We don't have. There's nothing that's indicating that. But that doesn't mean that we won't find that later. So keep that in mind. Um, because what if they used tools that were made from wood? that would not have preserved the way that the tools made from stone preserved. Um, so, but we do know that, and that this is the point of this, this slide, is that Neanderthals um, and, and Heidelbergensis, we have evidence that they had used uh, spears, like wooden spears. Had to be the right kind of, you know, uh, um, um, mixture of interesting soil and preservation. Like, we just happen to get these preserved. Um, so we can see the evidence that they use this type of, uh, of of weapon, which is very interesting, you know, as hunters. So there is some evidence of that. <clears throat> Slide 29, Neanderthal religion. Um, this is the first time we see evidence of religion. Um, how do I, how do I break this? Okay, so imagine, like, like usually in class I would ask you, okay, everyone imagine a loved one has just died what do we do? Like, what do we do as a culture? And usually you would answer certain ways. And usually the answers we get are, you know, um, there would be some kind of service, like a funeral service. Usually people, loved ones, family would talk about, they, you know, they might um, talk about uh, some interesting stories of that person or um, things about that person. Maybe they would, they would then be buried or there would be some kind of a cremation process. Then maybe there'd be some kind of like wake or, or party of some sort after where people would gather with food. Like we have a lot of cultural practices around someone dying, um, like the grief process. Usually there are religious, not always, but often implications for that. Um, so there's a lot going on like culturally um, for, for to recognize that person has died, to recognize their life, to come together as a community and a family. Like we do all this really interesting stuff culturally. Um, we do all those things because we have a way of thinking about, like we, we, when we see someone die or when we know someone has died, like it means something more to us. Like it has a particular significance to us, especially because 
many individuals and different cultures around the world practice some form of religion that often has some kind of idea of an afterlife. So if someone passes, usually we have an idea like that maybe there's something called a soul or something to that, something similar to that. Maybe that is still present in some way, either here or on, a, in another, on another plane. Um, so we have all these interesting like ideas and, and beliefs behind, behind death. Um, and we have all these interesting cultural traditions surrounding it, like through time, cult different cultures. Um, that's very different from, from other animals. So for example, like we do, there's plenty of research showing that other animals grieve um, um, like their, their loved ones. Um, we see this in, you know, some, uh, actually like a lot of mammals for sure. Um, we definitely see this in, in primate species and other highly intelligent species like you know elephants and stuff pigs um but hold on one second my girls are making a lot of noise okay okay um but imagine you let's see we can think of a good example so like when i used to give this example when i taught in california we had like squirrels everywhere on campus that doesn't really work for nevada what do we have birds birds everywhere okay so imagine you're on campus and you see a bird and we see this sometimes unfortunately like there's a dead bird um it's very sad maybe another bird has noticed and maybe you might be thinking does that bird know his friend bird has died like probably like maybe it probably depends on the species but like probably like they don't they understand something something to what level and how do they symbolically understand it like we don't know that but now imagine you see this bird, it has died, it's the friend bird is next to it, and suddenly that friend bird maybe starts to bury it, maybe starts to put in special seeds into that burial with that bird. And other birds form a circle and start decorating the the grave of the bird. You would probably be like, oh my god, like something, something, something crazy is going on. But you would probably think there's a higher cognitive function going on with those birds right now. Like they are thinking about things in a, in a way that we would not expect. Like there's something else that goes on in the mind of, of animals who, who do that and practice that. And so we see this for the first time, like historically, we see it in Neanderthals. It's not in humans. We see it in Neanderthals. They're the first to do this. So we have evidence of them burying their dead. And not just burying their dead because people will say, well, I don't know, like maybe they didn't want it to smell. So they buried their dead. Okay, like sure. But they're burying them in very deliberate positions. Um, we see them decorating the grave, um, inside the grave, around the grave, with like um, you know certain types of natural dyes or with uh, shells or beads. Um, what what's called uh, what are called grave goods. So like if you go to a funeral, you might see like loved ones put like maybe things into the the casket, like maybe that person's favorite book or their favorite you know necklace or something like that. Um, or maybe even you give them some, like you give them your favorite, you know, scarf so they can have with them. Like those are grave goods. And they often tell us more about the people who put, who put them in there than the person who's buried. But there's still like, it's, there's still all this really interesting, like cultural and, and emotional significance to that. Um, so we see this with, with Neanderthal graves. We hadn't seen any of this before. Um, so it's showing us there's something else that's going on culturally with uh, the species. Um, and you can see here, there's a picture of that. The next slide, there are some more pictures. So slide 30, you'll see um, some more pictures of this, the Neanderthal individuals being buried in very particular positions, um, the graves being decorated um, time and time again. Next slide, slide 31. Um, so this kind of just, just goes off what I was just saying about different types of art. So we see this with Neanderthals as well, whether it's uh, some kind of jewelry or cave art. Um, I mean, this is a whole other discussion about like culture and like why do we so i would normally in class i would ask you like why do you why do you wear jewelry um it's pretty um maybe it has a religious significance maybe it has another type of cultural significance like a wedding ring um, we wear jewelry for a lot of different reasons typically what it is is we are trying to convey information of some sort like i'm i'm like i have very bright earrings on Maybe I'm trying to convey that I have a very fun personality. Like, who knows? Um, if I had, like, a crucifix, I, might, I would be conveying to other people that I'm religious in some way. Um, if I have something very expensive on, maybe I want to convey that I have a lot of wealth. We don't often think of it 
in those like specific terms all the time, but this is this is very accurate. Um, it, like I mentioned before, like a wedding ring, you're, you're conveying uh, um, cultural information with that about your relationship status. Um, so when you start thinking about animals who, who do this, who adorn their body in some way, whether it's jewelry or clothing or makeup, um, it's not always, like with clothing, we could say, okay, there's a, le a level of protection. Um, but when it comes to jewelry, that there's something else going on. Like the fact that, and then if, even, if you're even if it's just because you think it's pretty, like that idea of art and beauty being something that you've incorporated into your personal life is still is still something very very interesting. So we see this with Neanderthals. Um, okay, next slide, slide thirty two. Okay, so now some more information. So I gave you a lot of background, some really cool stuff about Neanderthals. There's a lot of research on Neanderthals. Okay, so now now we're seeing some more some more specific details about them. Um, um, so this, uh, the dates, so now, like I said before, even with Heidelbergensis, with Neanderthals were in the hundreds of thousands of years ago, even into the ten thousands of years ago, this is not that long ago. Um, they are, they existed in like modern day, like uh, Middle East and, and Europe. Um, Neanderthals, they were the first fossil hominin ever discovered, so this, there's a date right there, in 1856. Um, someone found a Neanderthal skull, they brought it to a local like school teacher, um, they thought at first it was, uh, cause it looked human-ish. They're like, maybe it's some kind of deformed human that died. Uh, he had a brain disease. That's why his brain is kind of shaped weird and kind of big. Um, no one really knew. And so remember I mentioned this before that the, a lot of these scientists, like they had in their mind, like, okay, um, evolution occurred. Humans are no exception to that. Um, but they didn't have any fossils. So imagine there are no fossils and all they have is the idea that we're probably related to the apes and then they can see our own, like our own, like they've seen human, you know, homo sapien remains. There's nothing else. So they're trying to like piece together this puzzle, like where are we gonna find them? What are they gonna look like? They have no idea. Now, because we have so many fossils, um, we have, you know, filled in this, this picture and we continue to fill in those gaps. But at the time, like imagine there's nothing, like what would you think? Where would you think you'd find stuff? What do you think it would look like? A lot of the stuff that they thought was wrong. Um, so I think I mentioned this before. So they often thought, so also remember that these scientists, the majority of them are, are white men, European men. Um, so they have their own bias and they're thinking, okay, you know, humans are awesome. Um, if we're thinking about the evolution of humans, where would that have happened? So they're thinking because they're European, well, Europeans are the best. Um, probably the majority of human evolution occurred in Europe. Now, some of it did for sure, but th the majority of it occurred in Africa. And we talked about this before with Raymond Dart, that he was like, no, no, I found this stuff in South Africa. And they were like, no, couldn't be Africa, no way. They were totally wrong because now we know the majority of, our, of human evolution occurred in Africa. Um, so they're thinking they're gonna find all this really cool stuff in Europe. And they're also, they also thought, okay, what's the hallmark of humanity? Like what really separates us from the rest of animals? And they, they thought, well, it must be that we're really smart. Like it must be our big brains. So they thought they would see big brains right away, early on, it would kind of be the hallmark of our entire lineage. And what we know now is that's not what happened. That big brains didn't really happen until more recently in, in this lineage since our split with chimps. And it was bipedalism that was actually like the hallmark of, of our entire lineage. And they didn't really think about that. They thought they'd see like a big brained, um, kind of ape-like body. And then like, then they would see something more modern looking later. In fact, we know it was the opposite. Like we were bipedal and walking on two legs and had like modern stature. And then our brains got bigger. So it was almost like the opposite. So they had no idea. So when we first start finding these, whether it's this first Neanderthal or whether it's Raymond Dart with the Australopithecines or whether it's Eugene Dubois, everyone's like, no, 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 it can't be, it can't be. And then we start finding more and more and they're like, oh, we were wrong. Like this is all kind of making sense now. Okay, so anyway, so, but, Neanderthal was the very first hominin that was ever found. Um, was the very first one to kind of start this whole, you know, process of uh, and whole field of paleoanthropology. Okay, next slide, slide thirty-three. Okay, so now some interesting Neanderthal morphology. Um, long, low cranium. So, so, so it's big, fifteen hundred cc's we have right there, but still that kind of football-shaped cranium. This next part. It says adapted for glacial environments. 
or glacial climates. And then I have, or were they? Question mark. So here's the thing. If you're reading the book, the book is probably going to tell you that Neanderthals have a very, I don't know why I started whispering, that Neanderthals have a very specific adaptation to um, this really cold Ice Age Europe. And a lot of their really unique, specific derived traits are because of an adaptation to this very unique climate. However, this was like a classic idea in Neanderthal research. They had this really unique environment, all of, all of these really unique features. They must go hand in hand perfectly. And then people started to actually research this and we realized some of this stuff doesn't really work. Were they adapted to their, to their glacial environment? Obviously. But not every single little feature they have can be explained by that and not fully explained. So I'll give you an example. So you can see here in, in this list of, of, of um, I'm sorry, list of, of specific derived traits for Neanderthals. So the third one down, large nasal opening. So for a long time, so when you look at a Neanderthal skull, you see like a really big like nasal opening. Their noses were quite large. Um, and what, what we call like mid-face prognathism. So they were really prognathic here. And... This used to be attributed to people thought, well, okay, they're living in this really cold environment. They must have, so you guys are probably aware that you have sinuses here and here. So like when you get like a cold or a headache, you tend to have a lot of pressure here because the sinus is filled with, with fluid. Um, so in the maxillary sinus, they thought, well, the sinuses must be extra big. So it's kind of causing the bone to project. So there's, you know, this large nasal opening. All this is because it's supposed to warm the air um, to be more breathable or whatnot um, for these individuals who live in this very cold environment. Now you might be thinking, oh, I don't, I don't really know a lot about that, but that's, that kind of makes sense. Sure, okay, I'll, I'll buy that. Well, then people started actually researching it and they realized actually mammals who live in cold environments actually tend to have smaller, hear a noise, smaller maxillary sinuses, not larger. So that didn't fit at all. Um, the the big barrel chest so they have fairly large uh, ribs and I think I have a picture coming up the rib cage is shaped very interestingly and so they used to think oh it must be because their lungs are very big because they needed these big lungs for this cold air like none of the stuff is really fitting um, let's see what else mm, this one's interesting the first one shorter distal limbs so I know we didn't talk about so if you take the lab especially if you take it with me you're gonna learn a lot of uh, anatomical terminology. So if you're looking at a limb, let me show you my limb. So here's my arm, right? So um, on the limbs, you can you can talk about the directionality of certain features as being either proximal or distal. Um, so just on the limb. So if you're looking at my arm, if it's closer to the trunk of my body, that's called proximal. If it's further away, like on my hand area, that's distal. So I would say like my fingers are distal to my elbow or I could say like my elbow is proximal to my hand so it's all about like directionality so if we're talking about the sections of the arm we would say like um, arm and forearm um, the forearm is the distal portion of the bone this is the prox or of the limb and this is the proximal portion so for Neanderthals on that distal portion of their limbs especially their legs like the lower part of the leg it's quite short in comparison to like the proximal part. Now, if you're looking at limbs for hominins or mammals, like there's always kind of a general pattern. There's a ratio of like, you know, what it, what it should be, but Neanderthals is slightly off. Their distal limbs are quite short um, in comparison to the proximal part. And so there's been a lot of research on this and there's really no answer. Like, was it the climate? Was it this really interesting like terrain and geography? Was it, like thinking in terms of adaptations or where a lot of the research is going right now, and this is actually what I'm looking at for part of my dissertation is looking at some of these interesting Neanderthal and, and Heidelberg Ensis features is um, maybe it's not natural selection at all. A lot of these ideas we end up having about for whatever we're trying to understand or explain in, in the hominid lineage, we think adaptation, adaptation all the time, natural selection. But in fact, we have to remember that there are more, there's more than one force of evolution. Gene flow, genetic drift, um, mutation, uh, or a combination of any of those. So, so it, you know, it could be one of those other ones. So a lot of the research actually is looking at genetic drift and how, because maybe they became geographically isolated, we're seeing this interesting, these interesting features being more prominent, not because they're necessarily adaptive. Now, maybe they might've been sort of, or later 
but because but initially because of something else so so when you're looking at the textbook or looking even at older papers and it's saying oh the neanderthals you know uh, large nasal sinuses because of cold air understand like that we're, we're learning more and I would say like th this is this is a uh, one of those things I think I mentioned to you guys before when looking at the textbook you're opening this book and you're thinking oh this is like factual information and while it's factual now in five years we might have some really interesting new research to show okay yes we this is accurate we found more evidence to back that up or hmm we understood it 95%, but now we've, we've kind of learned something different and uh, something new and we're gonna add to the story now. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind with Neanderthals, very interesting. Okay, so next slide, slide 34, you'll see just some, some skeletal. You can see that that rib cage is kind of flared at the bottom for Neanderthals. And then you can also see that very large nasal opening. Oh, actually, go back real quick. There's one thing I forgot to mention. Slide 33. There's I have a picture there, and it's the you can see like the teeth from the side view. Um, so if you're looking at that list of bullet points, it's the second to the last one. It's called retromolar space. So if you look at that picture, you'll see behind that third molar, that last tooth, there's a very large space on the bottom on the mandible. Typically, what we see, so see that piece of I can't. It's hard because I can't point and show you. Like on the mandible, this 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 side part here, the mandible is called the ascending ramus. Um, typically, if you were looking at the side view for for you know hominins, um, after that third molar, you would see that ascending ramus kind of start right there. But for whatever reason, Neanderthals have this really large space. Um, we don't know why. Did it have something to do with the projection, the muscle? Like we don't know. Very interesting. But when we see it, we know we're like Neanderthal. It's a very unique feature to them. Okay, sorry. Um, so 34, we talked about that, um, 35, slide 35, okay, some sites, so you can just get an idea, remember, I'm never going to ask you to name the sites, um, but just so you know, they're, they're in these, this area of the world, Europe, lots of areas in Europe, um, you can see some of the, the pictures there from one of the sites in France, they're in the Middle East and Asia, a little bit, um, slide 36, you'll see one from Iraq. Once again, you can see that really large nasal opening. Um, a sight from Israel. I think that's a juvenile. Uh, another juvenile, slide 38, you'll see. Um, it's always interesting when we get juveniles for any of these species because it really, we can see like that growth trajectory if we have like a juvenile and an adult. It's always really interesting to see. Okay, um, slide 39, humans and Neanderthals. Okay, you probably have heard that humans and Neanderthals interbred. This is accurate. In fact, if you go, if you do 23andMe, um, I don't think it works for, what's the other one? Ancestry, I don't think you can do it with Ancestry. Someone, there's another one, like the Nat Geo one, you might be able to, but I know for 23andMe. If you do 23andMe, you can find out if you have any Neanderthal DNA or how much you have. I think the most any human can have is something like close to 4%. Um, that's like uniquely Neanderthal DNA. Um, most people would have like significantly less than that, but you can find out, you can be like, oh, I'm 1.2% Neanderthal. Like I still, I keep telling myself every Christmas, I'm like, I'm gonna buy myself that for Christmas and I just never do, I should do it. I should do it because I keep saying I'm gonna do it, I don't. Anyway, I wanna know. Um, but we know that they interbred. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, humans are a species, Neanderthals are another species, but we interbred, I thought that a species, so we recall this idea of the species concept and, and also some of the discussions you guys had in your, in your uh, exam number two. Why is species so hard sometimes to kind of understand, conceptualize, implement? Because we often have exceptions to the rule like this, like morphologically, adaptively, Homo sapiens and Neanderthal is completely different, obviously different in so many interesting and unique ways, there's no doubt. But, but we share a common ancestor with them in Heidelbergensis. That's not that long ago. So they were, genetically, we were still able to interbreed. And imagine like if you saw a Neanderthal, there's actually some research on this, that if a, if a human female saw a male Neanderthal, he would look to her as just a hyper, hyper masculine male. Um, they looked similar enough um, <clears throat> and genetically could still, could still interbreed. Um, and we have we have evidence uh, of this happening. 
um, the story that humans came in to where Neanderthals were living and we like, you know, ate them or, or like, uh, you know, killed them all, like not accurate. In fact, not at all. Like, in fact, we coexisted with them for tens of thousands of years in similar parts of the world, um, interbred with them. Now, did we outcompete them? Yes, took a long time. And all it really took was a few uh, interesting kind of factors, environmental and cultural to kind of happen that we just had the slight upper hand in terms of like we, we made it and they didn't like really. Um, but like I mentioned before, Neanderthals, as a species were around much longer than we've been around so far. Um, so keep that in mind. But um, I, th I think there's a point where I get into the details of that a little bit more later. Um, okay, so slide 40. So you'll see very, my simpl simplified, it's like kind of complex now because I keep adding to it. This this paint uh, timeline, you'll see I added Heidelbergensis in there as the common ancestor between Neanderthals and humans. And Okay, so that is where, and I'll stop. Let me think, am I gonna add anything? You know what, I'll say it now because I don't wanna forget for the next one. Okay, so, so real quick, back to what I was saying on slide 39 about Neanderthals and humans. So um, as, as uh, I will get into this in more detail later, but I wanna kinda just talk about it now just briefly. Um, Neanderthals are living in Ice Age Europe. Homo sapiens are evolving in Africa. Suddenly the world is just getting a little bit warmer human homo sapiens you know start to migrate into these areas probably following food that they're hunting um neanderthals are now like oh who's this new group of things that look kind of like us but sort of different um it's the homo sapiens and um so now they're now now what we have is is two highly intelligent um primates who are now have a competitor that they never had before and both highly skilled and successful uh, as, a, as a species, both of them. Uh, however, the world's getting a little warmer. Uh, Neanderthals are probably more well adapted to the cold. And now suddenly they have this competitor they didn't have before. Humans probably just doing a little bit better. Um, there's still a lot of research coming into this. I think it, it's hard because when we're looking at like these, you know, migration patterns of food that they're hunting, like a lot of this takes like, you know, years and years to get this information to, to really get this bigger picture. But what we know now is that they definitely didn't, like we didn't come in and kill them. We didn't eat them. I've heard some crazy stories. Um, in fact, we coexisted in the same areas of the world with them for tens of thousands of years. We just ended up doing a little bit better than they did. Um, and uh, we interbred with them, obviously. Not to say that there wasn't, you know, conflict. I'm sure that there was, for sure. Um, but I don't think not in these weird stories that I've heard, you know. Uh, okay. Okay, so that's where we'll end it on, what was the last slide we did? Slide 40. Okay, and then I'll finish up the other uh, 40 to whatever the last one on part three. Okay, that's it, guys.